Happy Tuesday. Welcome back to Post Force Live. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your host, Jonathan Forsyth. Joining me back in the seat is the office linebacker, LeVar Arrington. LeVar, are you playing golf today or something? Yeah, well, I just like to look like uh, I'm Tiger Woods. <laughs> you look just he like Tiger. He was just hair. Yeah. You, know. you look just like Tiger. Well, with a tan, of course. <laughs> a tan. Uh, Keith McMillan and Dan Steinberg rounding out our panel today. Uh, happy Tuesday, gentlemen. Get your plans ready for 4 o'clock for the U.S. game. Yeah, I mean, that's, we work. That's right, yeah, you work. Yeah. That's right, we're the sports department, or you guys are anyway. All right, um, let's get right to it. we got a, bit, a lot to cover in today's show. We're going to start with the World Cup story of the day. Uh, U.S. advancing out of the group of death, which, LeVar, you boldly predicted a couple weeks back. He went where um, no man You were accurate on that. They yep. faced Belgium today. We'll offer some bold predictions off the top of the show. For that, later today, we'll talk about the Nationals and the brewing controversy, if it's a controversy or not, with Bryce Harper's return and his comments about the lineup and where he was batting, um, and basically how does Matt Williams manage that. We'll also ask if Adam LaRoche should be an all-star based on his numbers. Um, we'll get into NBA free agency, first full day of free agency for the NBA, what storylines intrigue you the most, lots out there to choose from, and also as it applies to the Wizards, we'll talk about Ariza and Gortat and who should their top, what chances, what percentage chances you think the Wizards have in re-signing those two top free agents. And then finally, we'll wrap up with the Terps. They're now officially members of your conference, the Big Ten, LeVar. Uh, we'll ask about who their rivals are and will be going forward in the Big Ten. All right, but let's start with bold predictions for the USA-Belgium knockout game later today. Mr. Steinberg, give me something. I don't know if this is necessarily bold or not, but I think that for all the attention and excitement that um, Josie Altidore has gotten over the last 24 or so hours, I think that he might not play, or if he does play, it will be for a very short period of time, and he'll make virtually no impact. No impact for Altidore. I like right. that. That was like the opposite of my point. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, Josie gets put in the match, and, uh, and he scores. Wow. He scores a goal. Probably. Sure. All right. Late, late in the match. So we see him, and he scores. LeVar. My bold prediction. Bold Here we go. Here we go. Drum roll. 2-1. Two, 2-1 one. Two, one who? And penalty kicks. USA. USA wins in PKs. They're going to have to because they're, they're strong. Belgium strong with their defense. So I, I think that it will be a defensive battle that will play out with kicks. And I think it will be a 2-1 win. I agree with this. So do you have a 0-0 zero, zero draw in regular regulation time, or do you see any goals? No, I think it'll regulation? be 1-1 coming out of regulation. Okay. I mean, Belgium has given up one goal all tournament right. to on Algeria a penalty on kick. a penalty kick. Mm -hmm. So they are strong. But they are Belgium is, is no better than Portugal or Germany. U.S. is battle-tested. I'm going to go one further. I'm going to say it's a 0-0 zero, zero draw, but U.S. wins in PKs 3-2. I think Tim Howard has his, finally has it's his shiny so moment. Uh, <laughs> I don't know whether or not Belgium is better than Portugal. I think a lot of people would say they probably are. But the U.S. got totally dominated against Germany and lost. And if Germany had needed to win 3 nothing, I feel like they probably could have. So I don't know. That oh, you that, think Germany was holding back in that game? Th they laid it on pretty good. The U.S. It, had a couple chances late. They had one good chance late. I mean. And it was the, the rain affected that match. The rain affected Plus that them, match. But it seemed they, to me that Germany was clearly superior to the U.S. Yes. So if you're saying Germany is no also, better than Germany, that's all that's nice. No, but were Germany is also superior. clearly superior to Belgium. They were all superior to the U.S., but the U.S. has advanced. The U.S. beat Ghana. They weren't su right. superior to the U.S. Well, I think Ghana was a better team than, I mean, than the U.S. Had possession the whole Ghana time. had possession, so, yes. Uh, but they found a way to win. Right. So regardless of superior or not, it's, it's the World Cup. Uh, you know, I agree. I'm just saying I don't. Can happen. Algeria I don't, almost beat Germany yesterday. Yeah, that's, that's all true. I, I just don't, I don't know that saying that Belgium is no better than. Almost hand grenades and, and horseshoes. I, <laughs> I, I don't think you go into this match expecting the U.S. to win or, or win. I, am. I think coming out of the I group am. of death, I think you, it can embolden you a little bit. Like, Klinsman seems to have a lot more confidence. I don't know. I, maybe it's just spreading. Maybe we're all just buying the hype. Who the hell knows? But it'll be worth yeah. watching later. It's, it's worth, definitely it, worth watching. It's worth buying the hype. Why not? It's the U.S. I mean, uh, this Why do the, I want to think that the U.S. is going to lose? Uh, yeah, that's, that's fair. I think one thing <laughs> that we should say going forward for the U.S. is they sort of still, for soccer more than for any other sport, sort of have this image of the plucky underdog. We might have mm -hmm. to retire that pretty soon because... I mean, they, they've had a pretty decent track record now for about four World Cups in a row of being a competitive team. I think you might be right, especially if they win this game today and they advance to the final eight. And, and I think you're right. They're on the verge of becoming that not-so-plucky underdog. But their I think resume you're right. compared to, say, England over the last yeah. you know, three or four World Cups, who who's, would you take? That's but history fair. goes way back. But then. also, who have they beaten? They didn't beat Portugal. They, right. didn't, they didn't beat Germany. They beat Portugal, they got no, through. too. 
They beat Portugal in there, too. Yeah. They drew with them. All right. Um, let's move on, guys. Lots to talk about here in our backyard. The Nationals are finally back to full strength in the batting order. Um, LaVar, I want to start with you. They win last night over Colorado, big sixth inning, where you finally sort of saw the potential of this batting lineup that sees Wilson Ramos batting eighth. Um, the, but I want to get to the comments of Bryce Harper before the game. And he talked about um, where he thought, the positioning should be. Obviously, a lot of conversation about where Zimmerman should play. He ended up at third base yesterday, which I think surprised some people. Um, but he says, I think Zim should be playing left. Rendon's a good third baseman. He should be playing third. We've got one of the best second basemen in the league in Espinosa. Of course, we want the best hitting lineup in there. But I think Rendon playing third and Zim playing left is something that would be good for this team. I think that should be what's happening. And of course, Espinosa didn't play yesterday. Correct. So I think How that do you manage that if you're Matt Williams? I think that you have the conversation with with Bryce to just kind of play, just, just just play. If you want to talk about yourself, talk about yourself. Talk about how happy you are. I I I think this is more of an advice approach than reprimanding him or telling him you're you're wrong or anything like that. Because I, to be honest, I don't I don't know the young man. But it seemed as though it came off innocent. Like you're you're talking about in your mind what you envision seeing out there as as a player. And he might have not even taken the time to add, you know, one plus one to get I'm I'm singling out a player on my on mm -hmm. the team that in I'm on. And and so I think that this should be a much more mature approach to it. Now, if it comes back some way, somehow within that, that clubhouse that he did mean it that way, then now that's a totally different conversation because you don't want to have a player create cracks within the, the chemistry and the continuity that, that this team seems to be forming at this point in the year. So it's, it's going to be Matt Williams' task to figure out what direction Bryce was coming from. If he meant it, it's a different conversation. You need to shut your mouth and let me make the decisions. If he didn't realize what he said, then you just kind of help him to understand that. Keep keep the conversation in this this realm here and, and leave those decisions and those conversations to, to me. Keith, the team's coming off a road trip. They had an off day. It's bobblehead night for Bryce Harper. He's making his, his return. It's, it's, a, it's a fun atmosphere, big crowd at Nats Park. How surprised were you to hear this pregame at a, at a Bryce? You know, it's surprising to hear a player say that to, to, to go against his manager pretty much at, at any time, but it's not as surprising because it's Bryce and because right. he's been sort of young and, and loose cannish. Yeah, brash. brash yeah, that's, sure. a, that's a better way to put it. But it's clearly Bryce didn't didn't think through the impact of what what he was going to say, or if he did, it's pretty devious. But but I think it's safe to assume he probably um, you know just answered the question free form. And, and what he thought made the most sense. Now, personally, I, I like the lineup with, uh, with, the, with the bats that's in the it. the best hitting lineup. Yeah, with, right. with Zim at third and Rendon at second. That's, that's the lineup with, with the bats. Right. And um, I, I just don't think he thought through all the way the impact of what he said, and, you know, the fact that we'll be talking about it a day later. I'm going to disagree with you guys a little bit because, first of all, he was asked about this last year, last week when he was at Potomac, and he mm -hmm. said that he wanted to play center field. And already then people were saying, well, you know, there's actually a veteran in center field right now, who, so it's not, you know, it's probably not your decision to say, I just want to go play center field. So, I mean, I, th I think that the ground had already been laid for this debate last week, and he should have realized at that point, yeah, this is not my place. But I think, you know, furthermore, you look at Ryan Zimmerman, who's still the heart and soul of this team, and the way he's handled it, and he just has said every single right thing for, you know, three, four weeks, whatever it's been. I will play wherever they need me to. And he made it, I mean, I think he made it clear that as a veteran, as someone whose arm is almost shot, that he would prefer not to be at third base, but he said every right thing. And for Bryce to come out, literally the first time that he meets with the media. Before he even plays. Before he even plays, <laughs> and, and to say, oh, this is what the lineup should be. I mean, that's just, it's just not his place. It's just, just not his place to yeah. say. But it, it, you mentioned Zimmerman, but everybody has said the right things. It's not just Zimmerman. Yeah. Espinosa, Spanet, nobody has sort of gone out of line with Williams I just this think point. it exposes more so generational gaps. Uh, you, when you look at Zimmerman, Zimmer, Zim is an old school type of guy. Mm -hmm. He handles things almost in, in kind of like a Cal Ripken Jr. type of way, just very, very well structured in how he approaches things. Add a couple of minutes to this discussion. I, I, I really think that Bryce Harper is just that new, that new millennium, new age, new generation of 
I don't care. Like, I'm here to do a job. Telling I don't them. care if you like me. I'm, I'm going to do what I do, and I'm going to be who I am. I'm going to be me. And we just heard Johnny Manziel say, look, I'm going to be me. I don't care what you guys think. I'm going to be me. I think Bryce Harper falls into that new generation of athlete that they don't really care. I don't think they really care what we think. I don't think they care what you think. It's all about how they feel and, and how they approach what they're going to do. What, what comes next, though? Do you expect him to come back out and sort of – curb the way he sort of do you expect him to kind of step back from that or to kind of play it down and say hey look I'm going to play wherever wherever the manager puts me yeah that sort I mean, of thing. He, he might play it down or he might not address it at all I think really the next step is what Matt Williams does and, and whether it's aggressive or, or passive aggressive and and you know I'll play I'll keep playing Bryce where I feel like playing him and not mm -hmm. not address it at all I think the manager has to assert his authority at, at this point or else you know it, it does have run the risk of running off the rails you know, and I will say, I think there's, we've had the debate on the show, I think there's a real good debate about whether you want that lineup with Span in there, or the lineup with Espinosa. But I think one thing that's not really debatable is that you want Bryce Harper sitting, hitting higher than sixth in the lineup. And, you know, I think it's maybe just like an old school baseball thing. You work him back in at sixth right. when he first comes back. But I think within a day or two, he's got to be higher in the lineup. You also do not want your team, your clubhouse, to think that Bryce Harper believes he can say and do whatever it is he yeah, wants to exactly. do. Exactly, and that's the yeah, challenge. We saw that for take a rookie place. manager, this is a massive challenge. We saw that us. take place with the football team, right. and you, you saw how, how that can, can end if you feel as though one guy is placed much higher than the rest of the team. I think and some people you, would argue we saw that with the hockey team, too. So. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> right. And if you, if you allow, if, if, if Matt Williams has to address it, regardless of how he re addresses it, he has to address it because there's always that – you have to, as you mentioned, assert the fact that you are the authoritative figure on this team. There's no way he can address it by putting Harper in center tonight and having Espinosa in second, is there? And have, like batting him clean up? Just as There's long no as he addresses it case. in the clubhouse yeah. with those guys, that's it's what gonna makes be, the most it's sense. It's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out over the next week. All right, let's move on to a tiebreaker, guys. An unsung hero for this team this year who leads the team in most every major offensive category other than home runs, Adam LaRoche. The question here is the first baseman. There's a lot of other good first basemen in the National League. Uh, LeVar, we'll start with you. Should Adam LaRoche be an all-star? All-star break uh, in a week and a half. Statistically speaking, yes. I think anybody would, would uh, agree and, and argue that, that being, being where he is statistically uh, would, would call for him to be in consideration to be an all-star. So uh, Recognition-wise, popularity-wise, there's there's some more guys out there that have probably more name recognition right. uh, at the position that that he's at. But if you're just looking at 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 statistical things, I mean, he's he's the number one. He's first first baseman, uh, what third best average? You know, first in OPS, which I don't even know what OPS or OB. OB plus there slugging you go. Percentage. It doesn't matter. I just know that is the number looks really good. And and <laughs> as far as statistics, <laughs> to be first in anything, I, I, I think that for them to be as well uh, playing as well as they're playing right now. It, you got to look at the stats in his rankings and say, yeah, he should be up for it. Hit a home run last night, too, Keith. Yeah. He, yes or no, all-star? I would say should, yes. Will he be? It's a little bit of a tougher sell because there's so many good uh, first basemen in the National League, although it's not a, as, a, as much of a limit, I guess, as it once was. You know, and, and every, you know, every team gets at least one mm -hmm. player put in there, and there are pitchers, I think, that are worthy from the Nats so that they don't mm -hmm. have to force a lineup player in there. But I, I think... Uh, there's a pretty good chance he, he will make it, and he probably should. He's been clearly the Nats' best hitter, most consistent hitter, even uh, you know dealing with timeout. I don't know if there's much of a tiebreaker, because I think we all sort of vaguely agree. Yeah. But I, I would have said 20 minutes ago, you know, there's just too many other good first basemen in the National League. But I'm, I was shocked by that first in OPS thing. That, I and mean, all at that, at, yeah, yeah, at that point, playing the kind of defense that he does and you know, keeping, helping keep this team afloat when Zimmerman and Harper and mm -hmm. all these other guys, I don't know if that's really a category for All-Star voters to consider but to me I mean yeah when you look at it that way I, I guess I don't know how you would keep him out that's a really good point actually and the, considering the injuries this team has had to, to be a half game out of first place you know he if you if you're gonna take anybody from the lineup it's him I mean pitching yeah. staff right, not I think you probably argue two to three pitchers yeah um, including some of the bullpen guys like 
you know, Clippard obviously had that one hiccup, but I think Clippard has kind of an all-star oh, resume. Yeah, the entire want. bullpen's yeah. almost worth consideration. I mean, it, what what won't help him is the fact that he's really low key. He's not sort of a guy that's going to garner a ton of sort of fan votes, you'd think, nationally. He does have a new uh, episode of Duck Commander coming out on the Outdoor Life Network this <laughs> that week. Could yeah. <laughs> that so maybe could help. That could help his chances. Duck Matt's him. fans vote for Adam LaRoche. The man deserves it as much as anybody in that lineup. Um, all right, let's get to our final Nats question, and we're not going to go the oven mitts route, although that was an entertaining post, Dan, from the bog today. Um, let's talk about the current controversy over, <laughs> LeVar's no idea, the current controversy over the seventh inning stretch music. I guess I shouldn't say controversy, that's overblowing it. Um, but Dan, you wrote about this. The team is going away from Take On Me, um, and they're crowdsourcing for a new song for a seventh inning stretch. Yeah, I mean, they, they benched Take On Me about a month ago, and they sort of didn't say whether they might bring it back or what their plan was exactly. But their thought was, with, with Michael Morse being as popular as he is in San Francisco and sort of talking in the media about how great the fans are singing Take On Me, it didn't really make sense to keep doing that. So they're going to probably have a rotation of songs. Last night they actually used uh, Ice Ice Baby, which I don't think was oh. very well received. <laughs> um, so let's cross that one off the list. But uh, right, they're, they're, so trying to, they're trying to take suggestions. So give us a suggestion. Dan, give me yours to start. I, you know, I don't really have a good one. I was thinking Marvin Gaye is a natural choice with some local connections. So, you know, let's get it on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For the seventh inning stretch. I, no, you know, I don't... I, I don't have a great suggestion. I, I know that I was I had 24 full hours to consider this. And I don't have much of anything for you. I, I think if they could find something with a local connection that would sort of prohibit other teams from wanting to go in the same direction, that would be good. That's all I got for you. You have to recuse yourself know, since you're reporting on this subject. <laughs> Keith, give me your suggestion for something. Well, I, I, read, I read Dan's post, and it, and it made me think a little bit. Uh, it made me almost second-guess my suggestions because in the post, the guy says, you know, we know our demographics really well. And then you read all the comments, and they're like, the journey and, and like, you know, like <laughs> right. d different kind of stuff. What, like middle-aged white guy music? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> I didn't say it. You said it. Um, but, you know, nothing gets a crowd going more in D.C. than go-go music, no. right? So, yep. so whether, whether, uh -oh, you, shaking his head. whether you go <laughs> Chuck Brown, which I know they already use, Bustin' Loose, I, right. I think that's perfect, um, or whether you go, like, like Junkyard Band, um, Sardines or Pork, nobody knows what it means, but everybody will be singing it. Or, uh, or, you know, even if you went kind of more classic funk like, uh, like the Blackbirds, like Rock Creek Park or something like that. I don't know if that, that quite works, but, uh, yeah. but everybody right would sing it, right you know? On. Something like that. Those are um, good, good suggestions. Yeah, these are sing-along sing songs, and, and go-go makes people go crazy. This is easy. It's an easy one. All right. And, and my suggestion is killing go-go. You have to have a song that transcends race, demographic, geographics, any of those things. You, you want to have a song that young and old people can relate to, whether whether what, what their racial background, right, ethnic right. background, doesn't matter. So what is that key song? Sweet Caroline. Uh, Come on, it gets, uh, it gets that's crowd that's participation. Still, Fenway does that. It, well, I, didn't, I don't know about, all, about Fenway. I, I mean, nah. obviously they made a great decision then, but Sweet Caroline <laughs> in the seventh stretch, young people know it, old people know it, people are having beers flowing and peanuts are, and shells are flying everywhere <laughs> to smell of popcorn and all that and Ben's chili bowl and all that stuff you can smell wow. with Thank sweet so. Caroline. <laughs> Done deal. I got, I got a, a, a totally different one for you. Done deal. Black keys, gold on the ceiling. You got to have something upbeat. It strikes sort of between like the older white guy generation, like those folks will like that. Plus the younger crowd's more contemporary. It's upbeat, so people dance to it. That's I've heard Sweet Caroline right. playing Beaver Stadium. <laughs> and uh, let me tell you something. Have a chance to, to get back to Beaver, that your type Beaver Stadium of, days. Yeah, right? To hear right. that type of crowd participation. Let's move on to right. NBA free agency, Dan, gentlemen. you don't get it. <laughs> you don't get it, Dan, and that's why you're booing. Dan, which yeah. storyline nationally and NBA free agency most intrigues you? Uh, I think that it's the Carl Anthony thing because I, I think that – Increasingly, it feels to me like it's almost inevitable that the big three in Miami is going to stay together, and so I'm kind of losing interest in that. Um, but I'm, I'm curious what Carmelo's going to do. I don't even know that. I mean, I don't. I don't know that Carmelo, that his performance deserves the amount of attention I that he's going to merit. That. But he is a superstar in this league, and people, I think, are going to be fascinated by where he winds up and whether he can drag one of these sort of top tier teams to be an actual title contender. He hasn't been able to do that previously, but uh, exactly. that's what I'm interested in. He has not been able to do it in two stops. 
So tell me what your 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 free agency uh, I mean, my, what's, what piques your interest. My interest is the fact that Dwayne Wade opted out of his contract. He'll, he'll never see the type of money that he had guaranteed on that last that last right. year of his contract. Why would you opt out? You, you opt out when you think you can get more or find a better situation. I think all three of them opting out of that final year, to me, is is intriguing because now you, you look at it from the, the standpoint, for me, I look at it from the standpoint of, all right, do I want to go where where Dwayne Wade is going? Do I want to go where Chris Bosh is going? If I'm LeBron James, I'm looking at Chris Bosh and I'm saying to myself, I probably can can still do well with Bosh. I just don't think I could do it with Dwayne Wade. And I think that was apparent in his post post interview uh, at the championship round. They're asking him about how much does does Chris Bosh and Dwayne Wade have? Dwayne Wade sitting right next to him, and he didn't answer the question. Not one time. He didn't say these guys have enough in them for us to go do it again. I don't think he's convinced that he can win with Dwayne Wade, which makes Carmelo Anthony an interesting prospect because they're all free agents. They were able to pull off doing a three-man deal before with a team. There are teams out there that would probably structure and restructure to figure out how to sign a Dwayne, uh, 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 excuse me, a Carmelo Anthony, a LeBron James, and a Chris Bosh. Where that, where that would be, I don't know, but it's intriguing to me because it happened once before, so why well, not remember, try to make it happen again? Wade was already in Miami, so it was a two. But they had to give Bosch him, and... but but they had to give him that money. Yeah. All three of them got max okay. contracts, okay. And, and that's got to be the only Keep. reason that that Wade would give that money up is is to try to stay together, suck a couple more years in Miami out of his career, and maybe make another run. Uh, you know, but to, to what get back would, to the finals. what would make it okay for a hero? They say it's Dan Marino. And Dwayne Wade, that right, are the, the heroes of Miami. City. That's true. What would justify getting rid of Dwayne Wade, bringing back LeBron James, and getting a guy like Carmelo Anthony? They say if you keep that whole team in place right now as it stands, and you get rid of if you get rid of of Dwayne Wade, and you bring in Carmelo Anthony, you bring in that extra score that you needed to have that you didn't have. But Wade this year. Would, don't you think Wade wouldn't restructure if there wasn't some understanding already that the three of them stay together? Out. What does it matter? That's, He's opted that's out. Whole, that's the that's whole what point. I'm saying. He's got to be trying to make something something happen in Miami. Now whether he'll be He's successful. Free agent. Yeah. Now whether he'll be successful is, is intriguing. I think the mellow thing is, is more intriguing too because. He, Maybe he feels like he was the guy who got left out of this last time mm -hmm. when, when, they all, when they all banded together in Miami and now he wants in. And if he can't get in, is he going to find himself a place like Chicago where his scoring is actually needed and they have a pretty solid team already put together, uh, which they never had in New York. It's weird to see Melo kind of force, he forces his way out of Denver and then now forces his way out of New York. But if he finds himself in a situation like Chicago, uh, or or like best, best guess, best guess for where Melo. Give me one one answer in the twenty seconds. I, I think left. LeBron leveraged himself well enough to get himself back to Miami and wades out. Carmelo's in. Whoa, that's crazy. All right, what do you think, Keith? I, I'll say the Bulls, although we should, probably should have mentioned Houston at some Chicago. point. Chicago. For Melo. Yeah, I think maybe like a random Western team like uh, Houston or Houston. Phoenix, something like that. Yeah, I'd see him going out I west. I think too. that would be unwise. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the uh, LA, to the, the Clippers. What free agents, guys? Uh, um, beyond beyond the in-house, the on the the obviously a reason Gortat. We've talked a lot about even during the season as being free agents, and the Wizards need to uh, make that a priority. And I'll get to that question next, but. What other free agents are on the market beyond those, you know, the Carmelo Anthony and the big three in Miami types and the Dirk Nowitzki's that the Wizards should be thinking about should they lose out on Gortat or Ariza? Are there any names out there that you guys see as sort of intriguing that the Wizards should be focusing on if they can't land one of their top guys? I mean, the obvious need if they don't get Gortat is I'm, the big man is a way more yep. obvious need than Ariza. Like Ariza, yep. theoretically, there are replacements on the roster. But, you yep. know, I think Spencer Hawes is like a guy that people have mentioned as a possible replacement. <laughs> I don't, you know, the, the center market is weak. And I think that's why, in retrospect, the trade for Gortat, you, you gave up the 18th pick, but you got Gortat for one year, and you're obviously the front runner to bring him back yeah. for another year. I, I don't, I don't think there's any way they lose Gortat at this point. Let's come right to that question. Actually, I want to get your percentage. Let's start with Gortat. Percentage chance that the Wizards re-sign Gortat, Dan? I mean, to me, Gortat's like 95 percent. They just were in Poland courting him. I right. Think. Yeah, I would say 99. 99 percent. Okay, yeah, uh, I mean, I'm in a kind of prices right not, the You don't not think Gortat is looking elsewhere? I, I, I don't know what Nene's. I don't know what Nene's deal is, what his situation is. I'd be interested to see 
if he's back next year and if if he you know you dealt with so many Nene's health issues what's that then he's under contract yeah, this Nene's, year. yeah Nene's I, I just would wonder if he's going to be here I, if if I were if I were the Washington Wizards I know you value Nene but he has not been able to stay healthy for your team I would be thinking about like a Greg Monroe or someone like that that you can possibly he's, he's familiar with the area mm-hmm. he can play that down low post block I just I, I think that that's even though under contract that's that's who I would be thinking about because of the health well, issues. So you guys aren't worried at all about we're top being I'm not, the top I, target I, for other teams looking for a big man based on how he played especially in the playoffs. You know he's talked about one of the biggest priorities for him is a point guard who knows how to play with him and who can get him the ball and he's said how much that his relationship with John Wall improved over the year and I mean he he was you know doing interviews with TNT after playoff wins like he's in a pretty good spot right now yeah. with a team that is willing to pay him a whole lot of money you know there's pictures of him hugging Ted Leonsis he's like referring to the Wizards as we on social media just seems to me like it's all okay. in place for him let's get let's jump straight to Ariza then Ariza's percentage chances the Wizards re-signing Ariza give me that Dan I think it's pretty close to a 50-50 shot, maybe like a little bit under. So I'm going to uh, say like 45%. 45%? That's what I've got. I swear, we got to coordinate this stuff before. <laughs> oh, come so I was going to say 45. I was going to say 45. Well, I was going to say 45. Like a little bit less You can say like 44 to be different. I'll say 43 to be different. There you go. Thank you. What, what 42. Uh, I would agree. I think it's. I, I'm actually agree with you. I actually think it's it's less than that. I think it should be less than that. I think it's about. Thir- it should be about 30%. The thing is, he has a lot of teams that are interested in him, and he. At least, for nothing, if nothing else, we know that he has geographic concerns, that he would like to be out west, he's a west coast guy, and that he's sort of said that that's something that's important to him. I mean, I think the wall thing also matters here, because he wasn't, Ariza wasn't making all these three-pointers in a vacuum. He had got a guy who was setting him up for that corner three over and over again, that's and right. he's not necessarily going to find that elsewhere. On the other hand, this might be his last big contract, yeah. and so... Yep. I think you also got to look at what so took place less than in, in the draft, and I think the draft makes a very clear statement that they are they are content and happy, at least it would appear on outside, that they're content and happy with the personnel that they have right now. So If he leaves, it also gives that chance to auto play. That, that's to what I think is the, court is the big I don't know that they have, got to be a have factor. money committed to a, thir- yep. a third pick overall that eventually he's got to get in the line. All right, guys, let's move on. Um, let's move on to the University of Maryland, which yeah. along with Rutgers is now officially members of the Big Ten Conference. So there's that. Uh, the... the uh, Mascots for all the teams were in town yesterday making a big campaign push, big PR push. They're in New York today. DC market, right, yesterday and today they're in New York doing the Today Show and all that stuff. Um, So the question is, and Alex Pruitt wrote a story about this today, um, and you could argue that this was a question even in the ACC for Maryland, but who are their rivals? Who will be the natural rival? Mr. Mr. Big Ten yourself, I want to start with you, um, with your Penn State ties and your, you know, your, your connections to Pittsburgh. Give me who you think is Maryland's most natural rival that will develop in the Big Ten. I think, honestly speaking, it's very, it's very difficult to establish a rival when such historical rivalries are already established. Who's Penn State's biggest rival in the Big Ten? That, that's the thing about it. They don't have a biggest rival. Okay, so that so I was wondering that. When you look at, we hate Michigan sure. and we hate Ohio State. But Michigan and Ohio State are that's right. the rival. Right, right. There's there's not there's not another rivalry game out you know, Paul Bunyan's acts with what is it, Minnesota and Wisconsin. Yeah, they have all those different like, trophies. Yeah, yeah. I, I get all those different things, but when you talk about natural rivalries, uh, to be honest with you, I, I would say in basketball there's the chance that Maryland basketball, if they can get back to where they need to be in Michigan State basketball would would actually show the potential Oof. and the makings of being a, some hard a, a nice there rivalry still. there. Yeah. Oh. I think that could be very nice, but as it applies to football, I think it'll be very difficult for and it's been difficult for Penn State to do it. Right. So I don't think I don't think that it's just easily established. Like Penn State and Pitt were a rivalry. Right. You know right. it, that's what it was. <laughs> and you're not going to see those type of battle lines drawn with a, uh, a team like Maryland, at least or, not or right Rutgers. off the bat, you got to give it, it some ta- time. Right? It take a long time. Keith, there, there's two main ways rivalries develop: geographic rivalries when you're fighting for recruits and, and fans, you know, live in the same household and root for different teams. And then there's the competitive rivalries. And until Maryland is competitive with somebody uh, in in the Big Ten, whether it's Penn State or Rutgers or or somebody else in the, in the Midwest, I, I don't think they have a natural rival. 
and I don't think you develop one until you start beating somebody. If, if they're going to be competing with Indiana and Illinois to, you know, to win three games in the Big Ten, <laughs> then, then that's who your football rivals are. Now, basketball is a different story. That's but your opponent. Right, and they're not, they're, right, they're not like rivalries <laughs> that, not that like <laughs> you can't get a ticket to the right. game. You know, that, that type that's of rivalry. That's your opponent. Dan, what's going to turn into the Duke-Maryland rivalry? You know, I think, it's, well, I think that in, in the ACC, it was two different things. It was a basketball rivalry with Duke primarily, but right. I think it was a football rivalry. I think Virginia was probably yeah. the school that people yeah. were most concerned with. So I think it'll be the same. I think, I know LeVar is going to laugh and, and turn up his nose, but I think for football, there's no question that the team Maryland fans would want to beat the most is Penn State. If they could only beat 100%. Of the kids go to Penn State. Yeah, because of the, because of the geography, because of the history. James from, Franklin from The James factor. Franklin thing, absolutely. But yes. I think for basketball, Obviously, it's not going to be a Penn State. I think that will be more like what, what you're saying, that it's going to take some time and, and some competitive battles. I would battles, love for that think, to become a rivalry. But I, think like I, think Ohio State, I think Ohio State for basketball, there's a chance yeah, there. Yeah, well, look, there's NCAA tournament history between Maryland and Indiana, the championship yeah, game. Michigan State's knocked Maryland out of the tournament a, few, a couple of years in the last, what, 10, roughly. Um, so, yeah, th there are, there's potential groundwork for rivalries for there. For basketball, basketball, I think it's it's yeah. certainly there more so for basketball. Than it's got to be Penn it's State, LeVar, for football. It's got to be Penn State. You're, State. you're, you're talking no about. No doubt. You're I want to beat you about guys the, the, the worst. You can't be a rival when you're 35, 1-1. One one. <laughs> you know, you gotta, That's you what gotta, it was in the past. Right. Well, now you, now you they're the same You can't be a rival when other teams' fan base will be overrunning your stadium either. <laughs> well, that's going to be every team in the Big Ten, to be I, well, that, But that's what uh, you got to establish the battle line. Hey, man, I'm going to Happy Valley. I'm going to wear my I red at Happy you, Valley. We'll I'm roll up there you. together tailgate. I want to check that stadium out. All right. Well, thank you guys for, uh, for your time. Good show today. Dan Steinberg, Keith McMillan, LeVar Arrington. Good luck, USA. If they win, we'll be talking World Cup again next week. Yeah, well, actually, next week we're on vacation again. Yep. We're on vacation. We'll be dark next week. Join us the week after that on the 15th of July. We'll see you back then. I don't know if the World Cup's even still going on then. Might be the championship the game. All right. For Dan Steinberg, Keith, LaVarrington, Jonathan Forsythe, thanks for joining us on Post Sports Live. We're not. Just we're, like stream of consciousness.